to start with a question, okay? Because you'll get an idea from my talk in just a second. But I want to start with a question. I want to get to know a couple of you in the, by your answers. So does, does anyone here in the audience experience stress at all? Put your hand up. No one in the balcony. Oh, a couple. Yeah, a couple down there. Yeah, absolutely. Good. I need to know from you what you think stress is or how you would define stress in your life. So what is stressful for you? Why don't you put up your hand and tell me what it is? Go ahead. Not everyone at once. Okay, hold on, right here. Meeting deadlines, that's stressful, absolutely. No, well that's my talk, don't give my talk away. <laughs> I'll get to that, I wanna know what stresses you out. Maybe that's a better question, yes. Other people's expectations, absolutely. How about here? Your own expectations, well done. Marriage. Marriage. <laughs> I think, I'll, uh, I think I'll leave that one alone for today. <laughs> My wife is probably watching, so you know, but yes, stressful events are difficult to manage. And we know them because what you've talked about is different parts of your life that are maybe applicable to your school, maybe applicable to what you're trying to get accomplished, or maybe they're applicable to outside of these academic efforts, like marriage. I was talking with a young man today in the hallway, his name's Spencer. And Spencer is waiting to hear his LSAT score. Spencer nervously looks down at his phone in the middle of our conversation. I say, what is it, Spencer? Nothing. He's stressed, right? He's stressed. And that's a reasonable place to be when your expectations are that you have a threat hanging over your head. So let's talk about why I think we might be designed to fail in this stress endeavor and in what we can do about it. So here's a character who looks pretty stressed. Um, this, this character has been working for about 20 years in the area of trying to understand what it is that pushes our buttons, primarily in areas of chronic pain, adjustment, and individual changes in lives that people make for their benefit, or changes or alterations in their thinking that aren't so beneficial. So, in this journey, there's been two things that this person has come up with. This concept of self-regulation, which this person did not invent, and this concept of resilience, again, which this person did not invent. I think he, ha he does have some original thoughts, but basically he's going to tag on to those major constructs. Resilience is a product of self-regulation. It is a product of how you manage threat. If we think for a minute about threat, and we think about all the balls that we juggle in our lives, okay, there's three major ones I would introduce. There's more, but there's three for me right now. There's something called your mental broom closet. We're going to talk about that. It's inside your head. Your social world and your health. The trick is, with these three pieces, you could say at any point that they are interrelated. You could argue that it's a recursive model. And the research will show this, that this connects to this, connects to this, and connects to this. And depending on the person you are, or the segment of a sample you happen to be, you'll have a different path to follow in feeling better or, as I'd like to say, de-stressing yourself. But for me, the key, and the key that I've learned over the years with the research projects we've been involved with and the great people I've worked with is that this mental broom closet might be the instigator. In fact, there's 30 years of research in the last couple of decades anyway that suggest that that is the key, that it is the key. Much like you are what you eat, you are also what you think. And that is, and has been for me, a passion to follow in my career. So let's take an adventure inside this black box, if you would, for a little while. 
And let's talk about this mental broom closet. Because if you imagine a pantry or a broom closet in your house that doesn't have a light on it, so there's no awareness of what's inside of this place, it's hard to go in there and pick out the spaghetti or the tomato sauce. Okay, I'm thinking of that lovely meal I had last night. And, you're, and you're, it's hard to find the cans in the right place. And if it's all in disarray, how do you find that stuff quickly? How it's not organized. So we need to think about this broom closet. And is yours clean? Does it have a light that works? Can you see things? Are you aware of what's in it? Right? That's been something that's been interesting to me for some time. Because if we think about stress, and we think about what stress is, stress is threat. Stress is threat. And if you don't care, and you don't believe in it, it doesn't impact you. It doesn't hurt you. There's no fear. But what we do is we present these events or potential stressors to ourselves in a way that promotes stress psychological or physical. It, to me, is the same phenomenon. I think it's very difficult to separate those two things out. But what happens in the process of stress, according to Lazarus and Folkman, and approximately a thousand publications in this area, not just what I say, is that there's a process of psychological involvement. I'll call it volition. A voluntary process that you have control over, but we believe we don't. And I'm going to show you how I think that works. So the first thing I want you to understand about stress and the potential, the threat of a stress, is the key. That's a primary, what we call a, a primary appraisal. So that if you think of something that is stressful, so Spencer's looking for a score, He's thinking, oh gosh, you know, I don't want to put Spencer on the spot, we'll leave him alone. But let's say Spencer is thinking, if I don't get a good score, this doesn't mean I'm going to be a lawyer. This doesn't mean I'm going to get a job. This doesn't mean I don't know what I'm going to do. Wow, I'm going to live in my mom's basement for the rest of my life. Might not be a bad option. But the idea of the thought or the threat, let's connect it to the LSAT score, if it's high for you, is troublesome. It's an alarm. You're going to ruminate about that. You're going to think about that. You're not going to let it go. You care about it. You're worried. You could say this is an exam score that you're worried about. You could say your wife comes home and says, I'm leaving you. You could say lots of things that could be potential stressors. But again, if it's not a threat, if you don't like your wife and you're not getting along and she says, I'm leaving you, do you get scared? Maybe not. It's the threat. So this primary appraisal is the start of the action in your brain. The second thing, of course, is the secondary appraisal always comes after the primary, if we believe that that works that way. And it's this idea that once you perceive a threat, you have to understand, can I beat this? Can I win? And that belief, is an important component in this mental broom closet, in this idea of do I have the spaghetti sauce? Or in this case, do I have the coping ability? Do I have the friends? Do I have my health? Do I have another way to beat this stress? And you take all this out of this closet and you pull it out on the shelf and you make yourself better. It's an interesting idea because if we think to what current and probably over the last 60 years, theoretical teachings have been saying about this is we know two things for sure. And you should, you know, this issue should be something that fits with your experience in life. Number one, we know that there will be A. This is not really the alphabet, but we'll pretend, because that'll make sense in about three minutes. A. A is adversity. And just from what you've said to me earlier, you, I know there's adversity in your life. And those challenges can be seen as small, and we can, re re you know, we can think of those as daily hassles. Little tiny things that build up on us, and then that straw finally lands, and you feel your back is broken. We can think of adversity as a huge impact event, and we've heard about that today as well. 
But we will face adversity. There, the life is adversity. But it's what you do with that adversity and that threat that's a key to how you respond physiologically and psychologically. It's what you do. Okay? So we know that adversity is associated with consequences. That's my C. And sometimes those consequences are catastrophic. Because we cope a certain way, we may turn to alcohol, we may turn to illicit drugs, we may turn to strategies I would not endorse. At least not in terms of making you healthier. They may help you in the short term, but it's not a long-term remedy or solution. And that's what you're after. Something that helps you be better in the future. So we know this connection between A and C. The event happened, and I reacted this way. Remember back to last slide. I said that in this process, there's primary and secondary appraisals. There's, what are those called? In other words, they may be something that it looks like this. In between A and C, you have B. There's the alphabet I talked to you about earlier. And B, in my mind, is belief. A belief. A simple belief. And if I believe it's not a threat, it's not a threat. If I see it as a threat, it can be terrible. It can be life-destroying. It can be crippling. But if we look at the word belief and we look at the L, you can see a three-letter word that follows that L. I think it's lie, not leaf. <laughs> Someone said that the other day. Uh, professor, I think it's leaf. I said, I, I don't, I'm confused. Uh, so now I say it's a three-letter word. So now there's no, well, no one gets it wrong. It's lie. So it's lie in the middle of that belief. So if you imagine that if, not all, because a lot of the beliefs we have, if we're rational people, are good ones. They make sense. They, they help us. But sometimes there's a belief that creeps in there based on your life, based on your history, based on your health, based on a whole thing that I can't talk about, I wish I could, but I don't have time, that supports that. And it becomes something that you automatically take in as truth. And it's those automatic truisms, so you might think they are, that are false. And we need to beat those. And you can beat those. It's like learning to ride a bike. First couple times on a bike, it's difficult. Second time, not so bad. Third time, you're getting better. Fourth time, you're going no wheels. I love that. It's a great image. So what do we do in our alphabet? What comes after C? That wasn't a hard question. <laughs> I, I'll try it again. Let's see if we get a response. Or I'll just back up. and come on this side. I'll go across the carpet. I'll ask the same question. You'll be prepared now. You ready? Okay. What comes after C? D, D absolutely. <laughs> Well done. So the concept of D, and it happens to be the first letter in my name, so I like, the, I like that letter in the alphabet, but I like it here because it does something for us. D is dispute. And I love to dispute. If you know me, you, you know I love to argue nicely. I don't like to be rude. Sometimes I might be. But I love to dispute. Right? And I think that's how I was raised. At least I've been told I've been troublesome in that way as I've grown up. So disputing is an important part of this belief. If you don't attack and dispute a lie, you're left with it. If you don't evaluate the rationality of your belief, you're left with it. And if that belief is dysfunctional, if that belief pushes you to coping in a way that's not good for your health, your mental health or your physical health, that I can't accept that. I can't accept that. I won't let you keep that. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not fair to you. And I'm big on injustice these days. I don't like that when we don't treat ourselves fairly. We don't give ourselves the love that we deserve. Because I know you will do it for your friends I know you'll do it for someone you love, and if I ask you they're in trouble, what can we do to help them, you'll tell us. But when you turn that to you, will you do that for you? No. 
not as often as we might like. Now, I'm not trying to create narcissists all over the place. I'm not trying to create a sense of I'm just going to take care of myself and no one else matters. That's an easy trick. Every time you get in an airplane and they talk to you about the emergency procedures and they say, in an emergency, and you have a little baby that you love more than anything else in the world sitting next to you and the oxygen masks fall down, who do you put it on first? Yourself. So give yourself that love and give yourself that benefit of testing beliefs that are painful and hurtful. And dispute the rationality of those and how they're connected to your consequences, which would be your coping. That's an important thing to do. We need to do more of it. And it's not that hard to do. It's something you can learn to do. If you're not good at it now, you can learn to do this. And you should share this with other people. My son reminded me yesterday when I told him about my talk, he said, I was going to talk about Muhammad Ali and how nothing was impossible for Muhammad Ali. He was the greatest. And his belief and his ability was so substantial, he pushed himself and his body to limits unacceptable to many other people. And my son says, well, what about Martin Luther King? I said, absolutely. He said, what about Gandhi? I said, whoa, absolutely. And he went on in the car drive home telling me about all these beautiful people and what they've done. And because he understands at 12 years old that nothing's impossible. But beliefs make things difficult. And I said to him, you know, well, sometimes people feel it's not possible. Sometimes people get caught and they say it's impossible. I can't change my beliefs. I can't help other people be better. There's nothing I can do. And I don't accept that. Neither does he. Neither does he. And I got to thinking about this word and I said, I don't like this word. I don't like it. I don't want it around anymore, so I decided to change it. And I've written the dictionary companies and said, I want to change the word. I want to make it into something different. I don't like impossible. I like this word better. I'm possible. I'm possible. It's a possibility that I can change my belief. There's a possibility I can cope with this stress. Well, all I have to do is talk to someone about it. I have to let my friend know. I have to look out for other people in distress. I have to give myself the love that I deserve and the attention I deserve when I don't feel good. I have to make this possible because you're worth it. You're worth it. And everyone else in the world is worth it. It's a, this is not a secret. Okay? It shouldn't be a secret. People need to know what's possible. And you're possible. So when you leave here today, I want you to remember that word impossible. And when you see it, I want you to put up your hand in your lecture hall, in your classroom, at your kitchen table, and I want you to say, I don't think that word should exist. Dr. Tripp said that, that word is not necessary, and he's trying to get it changed in the dictionaries, although it won't happen, to I'm possible with a new definition. I'd like for you to be part of that, because you're possible. You really are. Thank you for your attention.